We're back. <laughs> M B E part two. Part two. Part two. Part two. There was a part one, and now there's a part two. And we're back. And we're back. Telling you about part two. Uh, and I'm talking about it. Hello, and welcome to Remedial Her Story, The Other 50%, the podcast that explores what happened to the women in history class. Now, here's your host, Kelsey Brooke Eckert, and her partner in crime, Brooke Neva Sullivan. So it's really hard about the historiography of Christian science healings, Mm -hmm. is that in most cases, I have found it's really hard to know what medically went on there like was she just like bruised and it hurt a lot because that yeah like what is the science right and like did she like bruise her tailbone and then the swelling went down so she could walk again right (laughs) right or is this as she claimed a miraculous spiritual healing so those are all questions that i i have found are not answerable and i think you know, for my for my Mormon student who did his project, it's hard to differentiate like fact reli- and fiction f- there, fact, myth, religious belief, etc. And I think that the what I tried to what I try to encourage my students to do when they're writing about something that's religious is just to say something to the effect of Christian scientists believe that that was yeah exactly her, like her it that way yeah. I'm sure some of the listeners right now are wondering, like, how well documented are Christian science healings? Yeah. Um, and there are lots of resources that I could point you to. Um, but I think in terms of historical examples and historical sources, I'd like to direct everybody to a book called Paths of Pioneer Christian Scientists by Christopher L. Tyner. He worked for the Longyear Museum, uh, which is outside of Boston, and um This book basically documents the lives of these missionaries, for lack of a better word, who spread Christian science across the country, some of them heading to places like Minnesota. Um, And they interacted with people who were struggling with some serious disease like cancer and um, witnessed, you know, by their accounts, uh, these these Christian science healings. Um, And so this book... uh, is, you know, documented historical records of, you know, people's interpretations of what is happening to them. Um, and it's a definitely an interesting read and worth, worth checking out. Um, so she has, according to Christian scientists, this healing, this break. Miraculous. Like, whoa. And so she feels like, okay, I need to figure out what just happened here. And so she continues to study the Bible and begins to teach people this practice that she has, the science that she thinks she has discovered. And um, so she quickly gains a following. And I think probably because there's lots of people that are dissatisfied with, with medical practice. Methods, yeah. And um, she begins writing a book. And so she falls on the ice in 1866. By 1872, she has written and published a book called um, The Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. Mary Baker Eddy's critics basically accuse her of plagiarizing her ideas from Quimby, who from part one was this mental healer um, that she went to see after a life of illness and and cha- physical challenges. Mary Baker Eddy would basically spend the next several decades trying to distance herself from Quimby because she sees her, you know, Quimby is is really about mental healing and what Mary Baker Eddy would call hypnotism and memor, uh, mesmerism. And uh, she is, you know, adamant that God is the the source of this power and um and and believes believes that God is the answer that that Christian healing is the answer 
Um, one of her biggest critics is Mark Twain. And Mark Twain publishes a book called Christian Science. And I think that just also shows how important she is in this time, how popular she is in this time, um, that Mark Twain would dedicate an entire book to refuting her. <laughs> um, and one thing that's really interesting about his book, um, which you can find, Gutenberg Press has, um, has published it. It's online. You can read the entire thing. Um, they, uh, he went through great pains in Appendix A to find and preserve the original first preface to her science and health. And what's interesting in this first preface is that she literally starts the book, um, with a line where she says, at about the year 1862, having heard of a mesmerist in Portland who was treating the sick by manipulation, we visited him. He helped us for a time. Then we relapsed somewhat. After this disease and a severe casualty deemed fatal by the skillful physicians, we discovered that the principle of all healing and the law that governs it is God, a divine principle and a spiritual, not material law, and regained health. So here she sort of talks about Quimby. She engages um, in, you know, in sort of telling her, her story in her history. And when she revises the science and health later, she starts in a very, very different place. Um, her, the first line of the science and health is one that uh, lots of Christian scientists grow up reading. And it says, to those leaning on the sustaining infinite, today is big with blessings. The wakeful shepherd beholds the first faint morning beams, ere cometh the full radiance of a risen day. So shone the pale star to the prophet shepherds, yet it traversed the night and came where, in cradled obscurity, lay the Bethlehem babe, the human herald of Christ, truth, who would make plain to benighted understanding the way of salvation through Christ Jesus, till across a night of error should dawn the morning beams and shine the guiding star of being. And this is all like very biblical, biblical language. Um, and what's interesting about it is she, she leaves out Quimby in, entirely um, and doesn't, doesn't get into it. And I think what Twain is trying to show here is that she's trying, or at least attempting, to cover up this history to get away from these accusations that he and others hurled at her that she has plagiarized her work. In both editions, it's abundantly clear that she thinks that what she's doing is distinctly different from Quimby. And certainly her emphasis on Christ and God uh, is evident throughout both editions. So her book is distinctly different. I mean, it is a key to the scriptures, right? It is how she, mad she, are Christians at this time that she's like diverting from the teachings? Well, she's taking on two fronts, right? She's taking on Christianity, but she's also taking on physicians who have yeah. dedicated their lives to medical practices. Um, she's incredibly controversial, and we're going to get into some of the big critiques of her very shortly here. There are uh, lawsuits that are filed. Um, she's ripped apart in the media. And just to give you a little teaser of what's to come, one critic called her the ugliest figure in New England. So... Yeah, I mean, here is a woman. Who yeah, this has is like that's the a audacity. Media yeah, like who to, do you think you are to interpret the yeah, Bible in her own way and in write her own and publish words. stuff about it and send it out to people? Yeah, I yep. could just see like every chapter in it is a different interpretation of What's different of a, parts of the Bible. Okay, and um. In this time, the on, one of the only churches, I think the only church that allows qu uh, female preachers is the Quaker faith. Right. And Which Quakers are very popular in New Hampshire. They were, and throughout New England. And so there might be people that are accustomed to women sort of weighing in on religious okay. practice. But certainly people are not accustomed to a woman head of the church, a woman leader, the woman who is writing the parallel scripture, almost as, you know, and in a Christian science church, the science and health is read right next to the Bible, which the Bible is written 
entirely by male authors. And then the science and health is written by a female author. And this is very distinctly different. Uh, Mark Twain, again, one of his biggest criticisms is that Mary Baker Eddy is this like, I don't know, dictator of Christian science. He talks about, he titles one of the sections of his book, Monopoly of Spiritual Bread. He said, very properly, the first qualification for membership in the mother church is the belief in the doctrines of Christian science. You have to believe her as if, oh no, women speaking. But these doctrines must not be gathered from secondary sources. There is but one recognized source. The candidate must be a believer in the doctrines of Christian science, according to the platform and teachings contained in the Christian science textbook, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures by Reverend Mary Baker Eddy, end quote. That's from the manual. He continues, this is definite and is final. There are to be no commentaries, no labored volumes of exposition and explanation by anybody except Mrs. Eddy, because things could so error, create warring opinions, split the religion into sex, and disastrously cripple its power. Mrs. Eddy will do the whole of explaining. Herself has done it, in fact. She has written several books. They are to be had for cash advance. They are sacred. Additions to them can never be added. Um, and he goes on and on and on. And um, his point here is, is first that she has appointed herself this, this leader and reverend. But I think underlying that is this uh, feeling on his part that this gendered feeling that she is stepping out of her place, that it is not a woman's place to be heading a church and her opinions are inferior to those of any other church leader who has ever done that. In a scholarly article titled Mark Twain and Mary Baker Eddy, Gendering the Transpersonal Subject, the author makes a really interesting uh, sort of literature analysis of their two works. And one thing, so on page 31, she says, Eddie represents the threat to the integrity of sentimental womanhood through the figures of her two most aggressive competitors in the therapeutic marketplace, the physician and the mesmerist. In doing so, she paradoxically attempts to preserve her own considerable investment in the ethos of competitive individualism without relinquishing the anti-individualist therapeutic doctrine upon which her theories are partially based. Twain employs an oppositely gendered narrative to manage the identical conflict. In an incomplete manuscript titled The Secret History of Oedipus, the World Empire, and in his book Christian Science, his well-documented pessimism about the possibilities of democracy is displaced on the figure of Mary Baker Eddy. In scenes of cross-dressing or drag, which figure Eddy's transgressions against the 19th century gendered system, and in his central criticisms of Eddie's alleged plagiarism of her Bible, Science and Health from Quimby, which figures her transgressions against literary and intellectual property, Twain portrays Eddie as a specifically feminine threat to an autonomous individual male subject. For both Eddie and Twain, gendered narratives function to displace without really addressing the incompatibility of transpersonal or collective theory of the self and a liberal democratic discourse based on autonomous individualism. Moreover, both writers complicate or cross the conventional gendered categories as they deploy so that gender becomes a language through which cultural tensions are both represented and misrepresented. So you can see that there are some changing and challenging gender dynamics that are going on here. And I just want to pause here because as history teachers, sometimes we struggle. So far, we've been doing a lot of biography on this yeah. sp specific woman. But we struggle to understand where these people fit in time and who goes along with them. Yeah. The 13th, 14th, and 15th Reconstruction Amendments have Ooh. just been passed. Okay. <clears throat> Susan B. Anthony in upstate New York gets 15 women to go vote with her illegally and is arrested. We've yeah, talked we've about got that lots of already on the podcast. Um, and so those things are going on. But Susan B. Anthony's buddy, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, um, is seeing that it's not just the vote 
right? Women are oppressed everywhere, everywhere on in every turn, all, in, in every subject, in every way. And, you know, and, and she specifically, Elizabeth Cady Stanton specifically identifies the Bible as part of the problem. And so she actually writes her own Bible called the women's Bible. <gasps> and I, I think today. it's interesting. <laughs> it's an interesting parallel Right, you've got you've got Mary Baker Eddy writing the Science and Health with key to the Bible, key to yeah. the scriptures. Right, so, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton's over here writing the Women's Bible, <laughs> um, and a really interesting question that people asked in this time is like, should women be doing this? Right, because the church is male. Right, yeah, the entire leadership, other than Quakers, the entire leadership is male. This is not, I mean, we've already talked about Paul in particular. St. Paul, he, I mean, he says some, he is so limiting in women's roles and responsibilities yep. in the church. And Mary Baker Eddy really not having it, doesn't have a lot. She finds very subtle ways to include things that Paul said that she likes and then take out all the sexist stuff that he says. And it's, it's kind of a funny thing that she does in, in the game of scriptures. I mean, clever. Um, so, so I think that parallel between Elizabeth Cady Stanton writing that book yep. and Mary Baker Eddy is a really good one to draw. Ooh, yeah. What a fun, like, what are these two women trying to write about? What are the differences? Well, and it's, it's interesting because I have heard of, obviously, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. I teach about Elizabeth Cady Stanton in class, and I never realized that she wrote this book, The Women's Bible. Yeah. And why is it that, like, the moment religion comes into topics, it's like, we can talk about her so long as we're talking about suffrage, but if we get away from suffrage and we get into religion, then it's getting too... Too, too controversial, too and close. so yeah. we're not really sure what to do. And I'll just throw out this like interesting caveat. There's a, an exchange of letters between Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Susan is basically I can just like see her rolling her eyes at her friend, like <laughs> Elizabeth. Why are you writing a Bible? First of all, second of all, it's like get on topic. We get have other on things topic. to do. We are trying to get the right to vote. <laughs> if you start like condemning Christianity. No one's going to listen to us. <laughs> <laughs> We're losing our crowd. <laughs> like people, most people are devout Christians at this time. Like, can yes. you not? <laughs> Stop alienating more people. <laughs> That's wicked funny. So I think it's interesting that Mary Baker Eddy is among these women that are seeing um, a need for a reinterpretation she and Elizabeth Cady Stanton are doing it in very different ways, obviously. She's more focused on healing, right? right? Because that is her lived experience. Whereas Elizabeth Cady Stanton is more focused on, like, feminism. Yep. For lack, that, that would not have been her word choice, but, like, yeah. in that time period. Over her career, Mary Baker Eddy had a number of pretty public breakups with some of her former students. And um, unfortunately, a lot of those former students were other women. And one of the most public was a woman named Ursula Guestfeld. And in the 1880s, they, they have this breakup. Uh, most historians reduce this breakup to a kind of catty power struggle between two women. And what I'm really loving about looking at Mary Baker Eddy history today is that a lot of modern historians, a lot of modern theologians, a lot of modern literature um, scholars are looking at Mary Baker Eddy and trying to take her seriously as a woman, as a writer, and as a theologian. And um, so one of those authors, Amy Voorhees, looked back at these, these letters exchanged between Ursula Guestfeld and Mary Baker Eddy and um, basically concluded very differently than the mostly male historians who had looked at this breakup before. And she is like, no, this is not a catty power struggle breakup. This is a fundamentally different theology that these two women are practicing. And you can actually see these very deep religious gulfs between them in the letters that they exchanged throughout the 1880s. And um, Guestfeld goes on to found a new church. It's called the Church of New Thought. 
And um, unfortunately, she's not really remembered for the church. She's mostly remembered for her rift with Mary Baker Eddy. Um, but in her searching and in her wandering, she actually helps Elizabeth Cady Stanton um, write the woman's Bible. She writes and contributes portions to, to that Bible, which is really interesting. And so um, I think she's somebody that should probably be taken a bit more seriously for her theology rather than reduced to this like Cady power struggle person. Yeah. Um, and this actually gets me to, you know, lots of people of this era are weighing in on Mary Baker Eddy. And I'd be remiss not to mention that Susan B. Anthony, you know, was raised as a Quaker. Um, and so she's definitely religious, definitely Christian. Um, but, you know, unlike Elizabeth Cady Stanton, she is is not, you know, that is not her focus. Her focus is on suffrage. And so um, she's has copies of the science and health. We know that she gave copies of the science and health to um, her friends and her partner. Um, we also know that she actually wrote and, and signed a copy of her history of women's suffrage and gave that to Mary Baker Eddy. That book is still uh being stored by the Mary Baker Eddy Library. And when Susan B. Anthony was asked about Christian science and Mary Baker Eddy, she said, what of Mrs. Eddy? No man ever obtained so large a following in so short a time. Her churches are among the largest and most elegant in Boston, Chicago, and other cities. But it is only during the last half century that woman has been permitted by man even to offer a prayer aloud in public. The great apostle Paul joined, enjoined her to keep silence in the churches. For 1900 years since the dawn of Christianity, man has, may, has been much occupied establishing faiths and formulating creeds for woman to follow. Since she found her voice and her tongue 50 years ago, she has been too busy raising to her own level and adjusting her life to new conditions to do more than recognize the great need of humanity, fewer creeds, and more of the divine spirit. When woman does write her creed, it will be one of right actions, not of theological theories. So, I just think it's really cool to see how Mary Baker Eddy is deeply entwined with suffrage and feminism. Yeah. I think we're getting at something here, which is interesting. And in The Signs and Health, she talks about the father, mother, God. And that's okay. a challenge, right, to traditional Christian practice where yeah, there's you have... There, yeah, it is <laughs> father, right? God the father. Yeah. And I Father, found... Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Mom's not even there. Yeah, exactly. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. No no room for, you know, unless Mary. you interpret the, the spirit as, as somehow feminine in some way. Um, I found this really great scholarly article that's not written by a Christian scientist. She is a uh, psychologist and... Um, she wrote a, a piece called Mary Baker Eddy, The Woman Question and Christian Salvation. And um, she says, numerous feminist studies about Mary Baker Eddy seek to, seek to explain what scholars have dubbed her ambiguous feminism. This article um, problematizes both terms in relation to Eddy's gendered theology and practice, instead focusing on the larger religious project within which her gendered work finds its seamless, unambiguous significance. I argue that Eddy's early temporary use of the female pronoun for God is in context with her emphasis on Christian salvation mirrors her relationship to the woman question as a whole. It is empathetic and radical, yet qualified and ultimately subsumed by her soteriology, not lost, but included within it. She goes on to talk about how the word mother was actually a later addition. It was an edit that she added in. And some people think, and, and she argues, that this is part of her emerging feminism that she yeah, has that over the course. that she's trying to come forward with. Yeah. But I appreciate in this article that she talks about Eddie as this, like, person who's moving the needle forward yeah. but doing it in such a tempered way that maybe people don't even register that she's doing it mm -hmm. 
But I imagine that there were some people that would find this idea of a mother god very insulting and um, and, and, and inappropriate in a church yeah. setting. And so um, that would be something to look at, again, with that question of why was Christian science so controversial? I think this would be a good place to pause and talk a little bit about what a Christian science church looks like. Yeah. Because it's so different from other Protestant churches. How so? So the mother church, which is the church, and first of all, mother church. And this would be an interesting uh, question for students to debate. Mm -hmm. Was Mary Baker Eddy a feminist? And when, you know, she is a contemporary of Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and met them. So right. like, like she's, that, she's seen the women doing the things yeah, and she's not necessarily sold. Correct. But she founds a church, first of all. Yeah. And second of all, women and men are treated equally within the church. The way that church is structured, there is no pastor, there's no priest. And instead the mother church every week puts out a lesson that people need to read. And it is prescribed sections of the Bible and corresponding sections of the science and health. And so this is what the Bible says, and this is how Mary Baker Eddy interpreted it in the science and health. Okay. And any Christian science church anywhere in the world that you walk into, they will be reading the exact same thing on the exact same day. Oh, there's a theme. There's a theme, and it's the same everywhere in the world. Whereas in other churches, the pastor comes up with what they want to yeah, say Yeah, there might day. be topics because of time of year. Yep. You know, I can remember they would change the colors in the spring throughout the church. We'd definitely be talking about rebirths. Yep. Um, all those kind of things, but interesting. Yeah. Um, wait, is there a science, there's Christian science churches outside of America? Yeah, I've been oh. to, I have been to church outside of America. Interesting. Um, yeah, and so that's the other thing is that there are Christian Science readers. There's not, not like a priest or a, a priest pastor. Or a pastor, right? So they're just people nominated by you the know church the leader, the church leadership to that month or that year read um, read the different sections that the church, the mother church has prescribed to be read. So it rotates. There's not just one per church. Yeah, so you actually you have two readers, oh. and typically it's a male and a female, and they read. And so the the service goes back and forth from Bible, science and health, Bible, science and health, and um, and there are hymns mostly written by Mary Baker Eddy and Christian scientists that are. It, it was funny as a kid because I would go to other churches. You know, I'd go to my friend's Baptist church or whatever, and we would sing like the same songs, but the Christian science words for those songs are different. And yep. so I wouldn't know the words necessarily, <laughs> but I'd be like, definitely heard the sin before. So I got that. Um, but, but so that, that piece I think is very unique. And so her churches are popping up. You've got people, you don't have a, you don't have a priest. She's eliminated you that got like, to imagine male that, like, dominated role. Yeah, but like the Catholic Church or Christian churches at this time must have been livid that they're losing parishioners. Oh, and we haven't even gotten to the half of it. Mark Twain and his criticisms of her talks about probably the biggest insult that she gave to traditional Christian practice. She rewrote the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> and he goes, this is not in the bylaws. It's in the first chapter of the Signs and Health, edition of 1902. I did not find it in the edition of 1884. It's probable that it had not at the, that time been handed down. Signs and Health's latest rendering of its spiritual sense is as follows. Our Father, Mother, God, all harmonious, adorable one, thy kingdom is within us. Thou art ever present. Enable us to know, as in heaven, so on earth, God is supreme. Give us grace for today and feed the famished affections. And infinite love is reflected in love. And love leadeth us not into temptation, but delivereth us from sin, disease, and death. 
For God is now and forever all life, truth, and love. And I think probably the first line there is the one he finds most insulting. Our Father, Mother, God. So he has clearly done research. He's not, he doesn't write about things that he doesn't. Yep, smart man. Smart man. He uh, went to see the new church in Boston as it was being built. But he hits harder, deeper, and things get much more personal. So in the Christian Science Church, there are lecturers who travel around Mm -hmm. and and preach about their ideas. And this guy, George Tompkins, um, preaches about Mary Baker Eddy essentially being the second coming of Christ. And it is true, there is a section in Revelations where Revelations is all these like prophecies. And in Revelations, there is a prophecy that a woman with a book will come. And oh. and some Christian scientists interpreted that to be Mary Baker Eddy. Okay. And the church does not today follow that. And there are consistently people who pop up and believe that. Mm-hmm. Um, and it has that particular point has been controversial within Christian science among Christian scientists. And then obviously Mark Twain is capitalizing on that. And so he adds his own analysis here. He says, there you have it in plain speech. She is the mighty angel. She is the divinely and officially sent bearer of God's highest thought. For the present, she brings the second advent. We must expect that before she has been in her grave 50 years, she will be regarded by her following as having been herself the second advent. She is already worshipped, and we must expect this feeling to spread territorially and also to deepen in intensity, particularly after her death. For then, as anyone can foresee, Eddie worship will be taught in the Sunday schools and the pulpits of the cult. And he refers to Christian science as a cult directly. Interesting. He goes on to accuse her and the church of being greedy. Um, but in particular, this godlike worship me as the mother thing is the biggest thing that he is upset about. And um, Mary Baker Eddy, of course, responds. She says... Uh, It is a fact well understood that I begged the students who first gave me the endearing appellative, quote, mother, end quote, not to name me thus, but without my consent, that word spread like wildfire. I still must think the name is not applicable to me. I stand in relation to this century as a Christian discoverer, founder, and leader. I regard self-deification as blasphemous. I may be more loved, but I am less lauded, pampered, provided for, and cheered than others before me. And wherefore? Because Christian science is not yet popular, and I refuse adulation. In the aforesaid article, of which I have seen only extracts, Mark Twain's wit was not wasted. If the individual governed human consciousness, my statement of Christian science would be disproved. But to understand the spiritual idea is essential to demonstrate science and its pure monotheism. One God, one Christ, no idolatry, no human propaganda. Jesus taught and proved that what feeds a few feeds all. His life's work subordinated the material to be spiritual, and he left his legacy of truth to mankind. I have not the inspiration nor the aspiration to be first or second virgin mother, her duplicate, antecedent, or subsequent. What I am remains to be proven by the good I do. Four years after this response to Twain, Mary Baker Eddy will face probably the biggest trial of her life. And in this case, it's a literal trial. So Brooke, this is a good place to take a short break and we'll be right back. For lesson plan ideas and how to teach women's history, go to our website, www.remedialherstory.com. You can also follow us on Instagram or Facebook. If you think what we're doing is needed, please consider joining our Patreon community. Through Patreon, you can sponsor a podcast with a small donation. Patrons get access to behind-the-scenes information, gear, and bonus episodes. But more importantly, patrons are putting their money where their mouth is and making a financial commitment to getting women's history into the K-12 curriculum. 
We are so grateful to our patrons who sponsored this episode. Our herstory makers, Jeffrey. Our herstory heroes, Brooke and Barbara. Our historians, Jamie and Kent. And our allies, Nicole, Mark, Sarah, Leah. Thank you. You guys make this show possible. Um, so I want to get back to Mary Baker Eddy being this, this powerhouse that no one's ever heard of. Mm -hmm. In her time, she became a household name. She became incredibly famous. Her book made her a lot of money. Um, and there were people that wanted to get that money from yep. her. And so she um, becomes, I think, increasingly like keeping her friends close, you know, to, tr to and keeping those people away from her. So like most famous people, Mary Baker Eddy has to deal with the press. And this brings me to 1906. In 1906, on October 28th, the headline of the New York World read, Mrs. Mary Baker G. Eddy dying. Footman and dummy control her. There was a lengthy expose that went on to claim that the reclusive 85-year-old founder and leader of the Church of Christ Scientist was dying of cancer and that another person, another woman, was riding around in her carriage around Concord um, pretending to be her, impersonating her. They argue that one of her longtime friends and her secretary, his name was Calvin Fry, was holding her against her will in her Concord house at Pleasant View, which for the New Hampshire crowd, Pleasant View is right near where Concord Hospital is today. It's right across the street. Today, it's a nursing home, yep. and um, but that used to be her property, and um, oh, she had this like cool. beautiful home there that is now no. gone. Right. Um, but Which, if you've ever driven to Concord Hospital, there's a ton of beautiful homes beautiful. on your ride in that yeah. some have been preserved yep. from that time period. It's a pretty wealthy part of town, and it's actually interesting because in this article, they estimated that her fortune was about $15 million with an annual income of a $1 million. And in a weird way, what they're doing is they're just putting this massive target on her back. The two reporters from The World had interviewed Eddie on October 15th at her home in Pleasant View. And um, they claimed in their article that she was bracing herself. Her knuckle knuckles were, you know, white and, and sweaty. Um, she appeared more dead than alive. She was a skeleton, her hollow cheeks thick with red paint and the fleshless, hairless bones above the sunken eyes penciled in jet black. So it's pretty terrifying, the descriptions that they, they call her weak, they call her pathetic, um, and, and an unfortunate old woman, doped and galvanized, um, and it's just, it's a terrible, terrible article. The worst part of the article is that they make the claim that she is dying of cancer and that she is being treated by a Boston physician for her cancer. And of course, this is insulting to her and to Christian science broadly because um, of her beliefs about uh, physical healing and about physicians. And so the fact that they go so far as to make that claim just sort of just adds insult to already rude you know, commentary about, about who she is. The things written in this article are not remotely true, and I'm going to get into explaining why they're really not true. But what's important about this article and where it fits into a typical history class is this is, for the history teachers listening, this is Joseph Pulitzer's New York World, and history teachers should be familiar with the term yellow journalism. Are you familiar with Joseph Pulitzer and Hearst's rivalry in this time period? Have you ever seen like Newsies? Oh, yeah. Okay. So there are these <laughs> two. You know you can always get me with pop culture. Okay, cool, cool, cool. I'm in, I'm in. Newsies, yeah. Christian Bale, let's do this. Okay. So there are 
two major New York newspapers, the New York World and the New York Journal. And these two newspapers are run by Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst. Okay. And this is a time period where, I mean, it's the newsies, right? These boys are out on the street corner, extra, extra, read yep, all about trying it. You know, trying to catch, get more eyes trying to on get their papers. more people to read their papers. But these are probably the widest read newspapers of the time period. And they give rise to a term for journalism in this time period, which is yellow journalism. Yellow journalism, I think anytime you hear the word yellow, I tell my students to think cowardly, right? So cowardly <laughs> journalism. I would thought I was going like pee, like these are the rags that are put on the bottom or that. of, of <laughs> a, a kettle's <laughs> stall. So, but it's, it's, it's cowardly because it is doing whatever it takes to sell newspapers and not necessarily fact checking. Right. Or telling critical stories that need to be told. Right. In 1898, these two men are arguably the reason we go to war with Spain because they rile up the American people about things that the Spanish ambassador said, about all this stuff. They make claims. Um, The the Spanish-American War starts, there's um, a very serious civil war going on Mm -hmm. uh, in Cuba and um, there are human rights violations and things that arguably we should have been aware of and involved in. Um, and a U.S. ship, the USS Maine, is off the coast of Havana and it explodes. Mm-hmm. And the Navy did an investigation. They are pretty sure that, and it has later been proven, that um, the engine room overheated and it the magazines that were stored down there exploded as a result. Versus what the newspapers at the time published was that the Spanish attacked us with an underwater mine and thus we should go to war with Spain. And so people, you know, the rallying cry was remember the main, right? Like, like, you know, and so, and so people are like, we got to go to war. And so this is important context to what newspapers were like, during this time. Yeah. They're and just printing whatever they thought would make money. Exactly. So back to Mary Baker Eddy. The New York World, run by Joseph Pulitzer, runs this inflammatory, awful article about her. And we know that they actually really didn't even meet with Mary Baker Eddy for very long, if at all. They never actually saw her. And we know that Pulitzer basically runs with this article and he decides to write what he wants to write and what he basically what he thinks is going to sell. Peter Wallner is a New Hampshire historian. He worked for the New Hampshire Historical Society for a number of years, and he's actually written two books on people from New Hampshire, notable people from New Hampshire, two biographies. One of them was on Franklin Pierce, the only president from New Hampshire. And then again, to just illustrate the importance of Mary Baker Eddy in New Hampshire history, as well as U.S. history, his other book, A President, so A President, and the other book is on Mary Baker Eddy. And the book is titled Faith on Trial. And in this book, he actually went through lots of local newspapers and local documents that we have here in New Hampshire to look at this moment in time as Mary Baker Eddy's faith is really being challenged. He actually claims that attacking, quote, a little old lady living quietly in a remote corner of New England proved to be an abuse that would come to mark the beginning of the end of this frenzy of yellow journalism. Um, And so I think that's kind of interesting, too, that Mary Baker Eddy's article actually to him is is the is the peak, if not the downturn, um, you know, of yellow journalism in um, the U.S. And part of it is because the public is becoming less and less tolerant of the sensationalized news. In his book, he talks about the local reaction to the article. He said the day that the article appeared, attempts were made to refute the facts contained within the story. The Concord mayor and probate court judge um, recorded the day's events in their diary. Quote, a remarkable red marked day, end quote, in his life, commenting, quote, Yet I wonder if I appreciate the full meaning of it all, end quote. He was bombarded all day with questions about Eddie from reporters investigating the, quote, big scoop, end quote. The people of Concord were so distraught about the article and worried about Eddie that they asked Corning, the 
court judge in Concord to go spend some time with her and verify that she is in fact okay. So he records his final impressions. He says she is 85 years old and she shows her years, face sharp, form slight, hands veined but warm, in shaking hands. She is slightly deaf and said so, her false teeth great at times, and her hands indicated age. But considering her years and her life's work and the work to be done daily, I saw a woman who surprised me. That she rides out daily, I have no doubt. She had returned from her drive and wore a beautiful gray waist embroidered and attractive and hanging from her neck was a locket studded with diamonds or pearls. Her skirt was black and had evidently been changed on her return. And this is really interesting. He then actually goes to the Christian Science Church on State Street, which is right down the road from the Capitol building. It's the church I grew up going to. And he addressed a packed house full of mostly non-Christian scientists. Um, He said, the excitement is lively and non-scientists are worked up over this contemptible performance. And so he says, for the next 20 minutes, Corning addresses the crowd about his visit to Pleasant View, quote, amid a hush such as he had never experienced. Walner goes on, the next day, October 29th, 1906, newspapers all over the country carried statements of Corning, Streeter, Wilson, and others attesting to Eddie's mental health and physical well-being. In Concord, the evening monitor headline read, Cruel Falsehoods Promptly Refuted. The monitor's editorial lambasted, quote, a certain section of the American press, end quote, for publishing, quote, grossly fantastic and entirely false statements concerning the personality of the Reverend Mary Baker Eddy the discoverer and founder of Christian science, end quote. The world claimed its story was the result of long investigation in Concord. The monitor denied this possibility. Quote, no honest investigator could have stayed here even so short a time as a single day without learning from indisputable sources that Mrs. Eddy is alive and very keenly alive to all that takes place in the world and that she is constantly alert and thoughtful to do good to everybody, especially to the city of Concord, end quote. The editor of the Monitor, George Higgins Moses, added his personal testimony by writing that he had known Mrs. Eddy for 10 years and had seen her, quote, within a very short time, end quote. Mary Baker Eddy's allies basically decide that she needs to meet with the press, and so they gather a large crowd of reporters at her home, and this attempt really fails. So Brisbane's article really would have been important in helping her refute these claims. Maybe that private audience with a somewhat reasonable (laughs) reporter would, would help her really make her case to the American public. It's interesting, too, because Mary Baker Eddy, shortly after this, goes on to found the uh, Christian Science Monitor, which is a world-renowned newspaper. And it's hilarious because Pulitzer, remember, is the person who wrote terrible things about her in his paper, but he goes on to found the Pulitzer Prize, which is a prize for good journalism, good investigative journalism, which is, A, I think that's hilarious to begin with because of who he was and the yellow journalism that he promoted and propagated. And then it's hilarious because the Christian Science Monitor has won so many Pulitzer Prizes. (laughs) (laughs) And she founds the Christian Science Monitor. It is a... Normal newspaper. Mm -hmm. Um, It does have a section at the end that has like spiritual thoughts and ideas, but that's not the focus. And most of the staff writers, I think almost all the staff writers, are not Christian scientists themselves. Um, And that newspaper is world renowned for its credibility and reliability. Interesting because she founds that basically as a result of her experience with the media and how. How terrible it it was. And and as a reaction to yellow journalism. Sadly, Pulitzer doesn't end with his inflammatory article. On March 1st, 1907, he and William E. Chandler file a lawsuit in order to protect Mary Baker Eddy and her assets. 
Um, Pulitzer hired Chandler to start what has been called, and it kind of goes down in history as something called the next friends suit. And basically he felt like it was his duty to save Eddie and prove the essential truth, if not the precise factual accuracy of his paper's recent assertion. So basically he's trying to use the court system to prove what he couldn't prove through the news. And um, what's interesting, too, is that Pulitzer actually drops out of this suit before it is even filed, but he's a part of it nonetheless. This guy, William Chandler, takes over the reins, and I'm reading here from the Mary Baker Art. Uh, Eddie Library, he argued that because Eddie could not defend herself, he would act legally on behalf of her and her son, George Washington Glover Jr. And um, the next friends, Mary Baker Eddie Glover, the, her granddaughter, and George W. Baker, her nephew. Later, Ebenezer J. Foster Eddie, her adopted son, and Fred W. Baker, a cousin, would even join in, um, although Fred Baker would later withdraw. Eddie felt that both she and her movement were personally under attack, as she should have. Yeah. And the newspaper articles on this court case that are contained in her scrapbooks certainly corroborate this conclusion. When the next friend's suit comes to court, it's essentially laughed out of court, and Mary Baker Eddy wins pretty quickly. Um, but in the court of public opinion, she's got some serious work to do. And so Mary Baker Eddy's PR team basically arranges a series of interviews and public appearances for her. She meets with a psychologist to prove that she is capable of managing her assets, but then she also arranges and, and her team arranges for her to sit down with some pretty famous journalists to do these one-on-one -on -one interviews. Like, yeah. Pulitzer has this long rivalry with Hearst, and so Hearst sees this as an awesome opportunity to write essentially the opposite of what Pulitzer is writing. Yeah. And so he sends this guy, Arthur Brisbane, to Concord, New Hampshire, to meet with Mary Baker Eddy. So um, Arthur Brisbane used to work for Pulitzer and is now working for Hearst. And is, Scandal. It's, he's excited about the opportunity to basically get a jab at his former employer. Former employer. So with that context in mind, you can decide which is which is the correct document mm -hmm. to to do that but i think the context of the fact that pulitzer didn't actually get a chance to sit with her and meet her yeah brisbane on the other hand sits down and one thing that's really interesting about his writing style is that he starts his article just by describing her and the yeah. room millions of people in this country will be interested in the personality of the very remarkable woman who founded christian science and gathered together the great christian science following so he goes on to describe the space, uh, the little frame dwelling situated rather close to a country roadway in the most beautiful New Hampshire Valley. This is Eddie's thought has spread all around this world. It has found expression in heavy stone churches and great audiences from Maine to California and across oceans. This distant work her mind has done, her frail body dwells in peace and quiet in the simplest, most modest of homes, almost on the spot where her physical life began. He is not a Christian scientist, and he does not ever become a Christian scientist, right. even after this. But he's just trying to highlight someone interesting. Yeah. Um, he talks about how plainly furnished the house is, and um, and so you know if she if people are after her money, like there's not she's trying she's to not, say like she's, she's not, a simple living yeah. woman. So um, so I think that that story and the fact that he goes on to sort of you know in the context in the context of the Hearst Pulitzer um, battles, I think it's interesting yeah. that he gets this opportunity to sit down with her and in his way tell the story straight. Um, and he obviously describes her as competent and capable of managing her money and her funds and that she's not being controlled and that she's That's very nice. witty and intelligent. You know, he could have done something completely different. And, yeah. But, yeah, it's nice that he put her in that light. Absolutely. I mean, I feel like there are so many angles to get her into the classroom. You've given us now a third. Yeah. In addition to the previous two. Right. Right. Just the fact that she's a woman who founded a religion, I think, should be enough. Woman but that founded the religion. Now she's got her own newspaper. Female run. Yep. Yep. It's impressive. 
she's really interesting. And so I think that for classroom teachers to, you know, she could be one of those biographies that you just take a moment to recognize in class because she is, she is kind of unique. But I think the connection between her and Elizabeth Cady Stanton is probably the strongest one. Yeah. Where women are realizing that the church itself is, is a barrier to their yep. full social equality. And to contrast her and Stanton and their, the books that they wrote, that could be a really interesting way to bring her into mm-hmm. the classroom when you're already talking about women's issues. But then to talk about her in the context of yellow journalism, which people yep. do, I think would be a really powerful thing. Well, also, you know, we do have New Hampshire teachers listening. It would be, you'd be missing the mark if you didn't include her in yeah. your civics lesson. Well, especially because there are so many, I mean, think about the the towns we've named. Bo, Concord, Rumney, North I mean, North she Broughton. spans the state. Like, she's all over. She's world renowned. Yep. I mean, you don't get, we don't have a lot of those. Right. As far as I know, with New Hampshire. No. You could teach me of others, I'm imagining. But <laughs> but this is big. She's I mean, a big one. Yeah. She's a big one. And Christian science, I mean, there are so many things that are um, debatable about mm-hmm. her. And there are so many controversies that followed her life. Yep. And I think that there's a lot that could you could get into there. I'm sure that teachers are hesitant because of Christian science and not really sure what to say about a religion that they don't know a lot about and christian science itself is is tricky and you know there are but if you're gonna introduce religion i mean you could cover so much of the world just through religious studies yeah yeah and again you don't have to say let like you can simply say that christian scientists believe x and you don't it doesn't have to be a Yep. You know, you don't. That is not insulting to them. Um, it's and not insulting to any religion. Like if, if that's what they believe, then that's what they believe. Right. They're not going to con- contradict it. And and you can always say, like I've said, that it's on a spectrum, yep. right? As probably all faiths are. Yeah. And um, so I just think that, especially in New Hampshire, it would be it would be wrong to not teach yeah. about this woman who is such a household name Absolutely. in her time. I agree. So fun. Thanks, Kelsey. Brooke, thank you. I'm Brooke Sullivan. I'm Kelsey Eckert. See you next time. (laughs) Thanks so much for listening to Remedial Her Story, the other 50%. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts to bring more voices to the conversation. We really appreciate that effort. Until next time.